So uh, pleasure to be here and uh, for our institute to co-organize the event. Uh, terrific report. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. I learned a lot. It's an excellent, up-to-date, and very detailed summary of, the, of a variety of challenges facing the Chinese economy. Um, I think terrific for teaching uh, students to give them a summary of the, the current issues in China. Uh, and of course, it's very uh, policy focused, so there's a, a set of recommendations uh, in each of the areas. And what's nice, they even uh, mentioned the previous recommendations from the last report and what has happened to kind of provide some continuity across the reports. And as was just presented, there was a particular focus in this, uh, this year's report on firm dyna dynamism and how to share the benefits of growth. So I uh, want to make some comments about issues that I think are important for sustainable growth in China. And my comments are not necessarily about the report so much as about uh, the issues. Because I realize that the report was written in consultation with the Chinese government, so probably um, needed to reflect the issues that would be articulated in a way uh, more uh, that they, the government would be receptive to and be happy about. And um, I think there are a couple of issues, especially these first two, where I think um, we need to be much more critical about what China is doing. Uh, than perhaps is reflected in report. If we think about the real issues facing <laughs> the Chinese economy. Um, so I want to talk about those and then uh, talk a little about the issues in the service sector, which is now the biggest sector in China um, and is an important area for thinking about the future trajectory of growth. And then uh, just one set of comments on the issues related to building inclusivity. So one thing I wanted to talk about is, it's not really mentioned in the report, is the use of growth targets in China. So China has the system every year where there's an announced growth target and then these growth targets are passed down to lower levels. And everybody feels that they have to achieve these targets. And I think uh, at this level of development, when growth is slowing, this is becoming much more than in earlier years when it was easier to achieve high rates of growth, has become a problem because it puts a lot of pressure on um, people throughout the system to try to meet their targets by the end of the year and thus support really short-term ways to get the growth numbers up, which are at the expense of the long term. And in particular, this credit explosion. You know, China said before that it was going to try to sh shift to a more sustainable growth pattern, avoid this idea of just when it needs to keep the economy going, you know, squeeze the credit pump, which always finds its way to the housing market. And we see the housing price rises that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, and everyone knows how it works. Everyone knows how to get their growth numbers up um, to meet targets. But it's not in the more sustainable uh, interests of the economy in terms of really thinking hard about what are the investments that are going to raise productivity over the longer term. And they actually introduce greater risk factors. And so I think um, I wish the government would just stop announcing these growth targets every year. Um, and I think that would be actually beneficial for sustainable growth. So the second issue I want to talk about is state and enterprises. Cause even in the recommendations in the uh, firm dynamism section, there's a whole set of things about how uh, we have to separate politics from economics, that uh, we have to avoid uh, appointing political managers, we have to treat them the same as on an even footing in a competitive way. And to me, these are all like trying to fix, impossible to fix these symptoms without fixing the ultimate cause. So it reminds me of these very old debates about market socialism. You know, John S. Cornei, you know, for, for a while in his career really said, oh, we can, we can have socialism in markets. We can still have public ownership and if there's market incentives and we can get the best of both worlds. But in the end, he abandoned that idea, right? Because he felt that at the end of the day, it's not consistent with the incentives that the government leaders have when there's a state-owned enterprise. And I feel like the big advice should be to really open these sectors to entry from private firms. Or you know, even better would be to privatize the state enterprises in, 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 in a lot of key sectors if they could. Uh, but at least allow entry so private uh, firms can really compete head on. And as they did in many of the earlier periods of reform, kind of take away the market share from state-owned firms and eventually, hopefully, drive them out. Uh, if, if there's really a, I mean, this is, I know, kind of wishful thinking. Uh, China has said they're going to push to market more market orientation of, they've said it for, for many years, but I don't think it's really happened 
uh, uh, very much, and they keep control over some very um, large uh, strategic sectors that have market power, uh, they're highly profitable, so they're sustainable to state control. And I don't think um, the government appreciates the opportunity cost to the economy for how uh, less efficient this is than the alternative, uh, especially when you saw the figures about the high debt ratios of state enterprises, where they're still throwing lots of, of the country's money towards these uh, uh, enterprises which are highly efficient. So I, I don't know how you would articulate it, but in, in the reality for me is that uh, they're avoiding a key uh, constraint to growth. And by pretending that you can kind of tweak some of the institutions on the margin, I think is really uh, probably not going to get where uh, the economy needs to be to maximize its growth potential. And then another point about um, industrial policy I wanted to mention, which is not on this list, but it came to me when I saw the um, the slide where uh, there was this slide that showed that the subsidies for innovation are highly skewed to a few sectors. So there's this advice that they should spread this around, around to other sectors. Although it wasn't clear to me why we should just spread around innovation subsidies across, or why, you know, what is even the rationale for innovation subsidies? When should the government get in? And if, if so, in which sectors? And uh, there's a lot of debate now in China about industrial policy more generally. There's a lot of targeted policies trying toward the high tech sectors, towards robots, uh, and the idea that the government has to make these industrial level strategic choices and really think about this and push this. But I think obviously there are many economists everywhere who are skeptical of the government picking winners or skeptical that they're going to get the timing right. Should they uh, be pushing for robots? Is this going to lead to employment issues down the road, et cetera? Uh, a more kind of a framework for thinking more carefully about how to assess these different types of targeted industrial policies, I think, um, would be helpful uh, and helpful to the government to think more clearly, uh, clearly about it. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the service sector. And uh, I wanted to present a little bit of data based on uh, analysis I've been doing using the various uh, China economic China, not economic census, but the population census data. Um, the first thing I want to show you is um, just a plot of uh, the growth in uh, employment shares of different occupations where we sort the occupations by where they are in the wage distribution. So the high paying jobs in, in 2005 are on, at the, on the right and the low paying jobs are here. And you can see that there has been this growth in middle income jobs in China which is very different than in most countries of, in the world, both the US, uh, both developed and developing countries. And a lot of this is driven by a growth in kind of service sector, kind of not very skill intensive retail and other types of service jobs. And if you think about um, whether uh, it's, the, it's the high skilled sectors that are growing or high school occupations that are growing, there's, there's some reasons for concern. So in other words, what I want to see is whether um, we know that China is becoming increasingly skilled, right? Uh, so the share of the labor force that is college, so this is 2000 census data and the 2015 mini census data. And then we can see the employment shares of these key occupations and the share of the workers in each of these occupations that are college educated. And obviously we have top managers, professionals, office workers, they're the more educated groups. And the shares in the economy have not really increased. They've all actually declined from 5, 16, 17 to 3, 15, 16. Whereas uh, the sector that has really grown is this sales and services sector, 23% of the labor force, this is the non-agricultural labor force, to 32% of the labor force. Um, and if you look at where college workers are going, you can see that within, um, within each occupation category, the share of college workers has grown. So in, in the top managers from 35% to 40%, in professionals from 41% to 63%, from office workers 18 to 32, and even sales and services, you have the percentage of college graduates going from just 4% to 14%. And the result of this is actually that a lot of the increase in the employment of college graduates is not in the high skill occupations, it's in the kind of low skill occupations. Uh, 
And if you look at sectors, uh, you see something similar. Whereas if you try to decompose the increase in the overall demand for college workers from 2000 to 2015, you find that very little of this is from change in employment structure, meaning from growth, faster growth in college intensive sectors. Almost all of the increase is just within sector increases in the share of college graduates. And then the punchline here is now on the service sector is that we can also do the same thing for all of the 32 service subsectors where we just basically say, is it the case that the kind of high skill service sectors, that the ones that intensively employ college graduates, are these growing in the, in the economy or, or not? And overall, they're not. I mean, the contribution of the structural change or the shifts in, 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 in the uh, service subsectors actually contributes negatively to the increase in college graduate. Everything is within uh, subsectors. And part of it is that um, some of the public employment sectors, teachers, government officials, which is a very high skill sector in China, is actually even shrinking over this time. And the other thing is we have these kind of retail low skill sectors in services that have been growing actually the fastest, as we saw earlier. And so that counteracts any gain in some of the growth of maybe some of the more professionally oriented service sectors. One note of optimism is that if you divide this into five-year periods, you do see that in the most, re most recent period, you finally see some evidence that the high-skilled service sectors now are starting to gain employment share in the economy. So this is, I think, uh, kind of votes for optimism. But moreover, I think um, China needs to really think hard about the policy stance towards service sector development. There's a nice figure in the report about uh, barriers to entry in some of the high skill service sectors. And I think uh, more information and more insight into why there isn't faster growth in business services and other high skill service sectors that have been really growth drivers in more advanced countries, I think would be really helpful to compare what's happening in China uh, to those countries. Okay. And then finally, on inclusive growth, I just wanted to make uh, one point that. Um, if you look at what China's done in the last decade, they've really focused on trying to achieve universal coverage in a, a variety of programs, especially health insurance, pension coverage, DBAO programs, and they've been pretty successful at least getting, getting everybody eligible or having access to some um, benefits. But the problem, and was correctly emphasized in the report, is that this has led to lots of multi, multiple overlapping programs that are very confusing with very different benefit levels. And so that's obviously the next area to take on. But I also wanted to point out that this uneven treatment and enforcement undermines not only the equity objectives, which I think is straightforward, but also contributes, I think, substantially to reducing the economy's ability to achieve its efficiency objectives uh, because it creates an uneven playing field. So one area I've been doing work on is the enforcement of labor regulations in China. And one thing that you see in China is that there's a big difference in how the rules are enforced. And obviously, we did some work that showed that when China tried to emphasize the new labor law in 2008, what happened was is that the places that had previously been very laggard at enforcing um, labor regulations had, were you know, increased quite substantially relative to the places that had already been enforcing. And that was actually a good thing. It did reduce employment relatively in these laggard areas, but it had created a level playing field and actually helped the firms that were being more compliant originally, which actually tend, tended to be the better, more efficient firms in the economy. So a more even enforcement and treatment actually also levels the parent playing field and doesn't penalize your, your best, uh, best firms or individuals. Um, and another example I wanted to give about pensions is that one of the issues, one of the problems in getting the migrant workers in uh, urban areas to sign up or demand pension coverage from their employer is that now China has introduced what is essentially a social pension in rural areas where everybody pretty much gets a certain amount of money when they turn 60 every month, right? It's not very much, but obviously if I'm getting this benefit or rural health insurance from the village, it, it, it disincentivizes me from actually demanding those same benefits uh, from my employer. And in fact, if I'm young, I probably think, oh, I'm healthy and there's portability issues. and so. The two programs are actually at odds with each other. And so it's not just making them more even in the benefits. You actually, I think, especially for things like pension, you actually need to integrate these into one program and have a very clear thought that 
we should have a certain amount of a social pension that everybody gets, which isn't linked to contributions. It's funded by more general revenues, which is becoming a more popular kind of uh, a solution in many countries. But then in the uh, voluntary pension programs that are contributory by employers and employers, it needs to be an, a national plan, I think, for it to make sense for pensions in particular. But it, similar issues may, may, um, may arise elsewhere. And, and finally, this, the realistic design of programs that can be enforced. There was a really nice point made in the, in the paper about, uh, about pension funding in China, which is that actually in factories, the, the factories don't actually pay us a, a, a percentage of each person's income. They pay a percentage of some reference wage income that is set by the region at some percentage of the local average wage, which actually means that the rich worker is paying a much smaller share of their income in terms of these social insurance contributions than the poor, uh, the poorer worker, which is very unfair. Why did this happen? It seems, you know, the reason this happened is because the contribution levels were set at rates which were too high. Whenever you make a rule, even if it's a minimum wage or something else, and it becomes really painful for firms to follow, they're going to evade it. And in many cases, they'll get local governments to uh, collude with them to evade it. And what has happened is lots of local governments are helping the firms evade these things by setting these reference wages, which are often not even meeting these average wage recommendations. So they can, if you actually look at the data, we've been doing some firm surveys in Guangdong, you know, the percentage of um, uh, contributions into these social insurance programs as a share of the actual payroll bill is, you know, something like half of what it is, it is stated in the actual rules that, you know, there should be like a 40% contribution shared between employee and, and employer. So part of it does mean they should set, they should, they should be real and figure out what is a, a burden that they think firms can, can, uh, can uh, withstand and then they should enforce it very strictly as is suggested in the report by you know, linking individual payments to indiv individual contributions to individual um, incomes. I've gone too long, but thank you.